day around the world. We appreciate you taking the time to join us where you'll be able to learn something new, join the conversation, and ask a question to our featured speaker. We have Siobhan Choi serving as our production technician today. So if you are having any technical issues throughout this program, all you have to do is open the chat box at the bottom of your screen, select Alaska World Affairs Council in the drop down menu, and send a message directly to the program administrator and Siobhan will help you with any technical issues you are having. If you are interested in a career in the Foreign Service, curious about what people in the Foreign Service do or just want to learn something new, this is the program for you. The Alaska World Affairs Council has teamed up with Department of State's Diplomat in Residence for the Northwest to present the Northwest Diplomat in Residence, Michaela Schweitzer Bloom. Michaela, she's going to share what makes a career in the Department of State so exciting from assisting North Macedonia's entry into NATO, a 25-year U.S. policy goal, assisting sick and injured U.S. mountaineers in Nepal, to coaching new Iraqi journalists on the role of an independent press. This is your opportunity to ask a U.S. Foreign Service officer any question you may have about a career in public diplomacy. We're going to put everyone except for Michaela and me on mute. If you have a question, please just send those questions to us directly using the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll read the questions for our speaker. Before we start, please say hello to Michaela and introduce yourself using the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Tell us your name and where in the world you are currently hunkering down. For optimal viewing, of this program, put your screen on speaker view, pressing that option in the top right corner of your screen. Now I'm going to grab my lunch and turn the virtual microphone over to our featured speaker, Michaela Schweitzer Bloom. Michaela, are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's really nice to be with everyone today. Um, so I am uh, videoing in from Berkeley, California, where I'm based. Um, but I am the diplomat in residence for the Northwest, which covers uh, all of Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. Um, and I look forward to getting to Alaska in person. Um, but as a placeholder until I can get there in person, this is a great opportunity. So thank you very much. Um, I, my plan today uh, is to share with you a bit of information and a presentation. Um, I'll talk for maybe about 20 minutes, but throw your questions out anytime uh, you have one. Um, and I'm happy to take them at any time. Lisa will flag them for me if I don't see them. Um, and then I'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers because I'm sure that your questions are going to be really interesting. And I am just loving the uh, regions that folks are coming from. I saw Bermuda and Florida and Alaska and Portland. This is great. All right. So Lisa, if it's all right, I'll go ahead and start the presentation. Absolutely. Can't wait to hear it. Okay, great. Um, let me just get that set up and shared. All right. All right, so um, I always like to start my presentations with just a little 101 on the State Department. Um, some of you may already know this, but we are actually the oldest cabinet agency uh, in the US government. Uh, we just celebrated our 230th anniversary. Um, we are the primary foreign affairs uh, agency for the US government, we're a cabinet level agency, um, and we're charged with protecting US interests around the world, protecting US citizens, uh, and representing the United States in diplomatic, diplomatic engagement around the world. Um, my colleagues around the world are very busy on the protecting the interests of US citizens right now, as many of you have, made, have seen in the press, uh, as they're working to help uh, thousands of Americans get home right now. We have about 77,000 employees. Um, and if you take a look at this little chart here, you'll see um, the uh, majority of our employees actually are locally employed staff. And what that means is that these are citizens of other countries who work with us at our embassies and our consulates around the world. Um, they are our permanent staff at our embassies and consulates, and we really couldn't do what we do without their expertise, their local know-how, um, and uh, their long-term contacts. The rest of the, of the Department of State is split pretty evenly between foreign service and civil service. And I'm gonna focus my talk today on, on the foreign service, but I am happy to answer questions about the civil service. 
I'll just briefly mention our civil services are our permanent headquarters staff, primarily based in Washington, DC. Um, these are folks that work with us um, on a variety of dish issues from policy programs, operations, administration, our consular affairs, security, everything under the sun. Um, and they become real subject, subject matter experts uh, in their fields. Um, they stay in their jobs for a longer period of time um, and um, they, they're the balance. The civil service and the foreign service offer the two halves of what the Department of State can offer in terms of uh, our whole of government approach. Whatever our position in the Department of State, we do operate under the same uh, guidelines, principles with the same objectives. But I'm going to talk today specifically about the Foreign Service. Um, and the Foreign Service is uh, divided into two cadre uh, of, of employees. One is Foreign Service Officers, or Generalists is also what they're known as, and Foreign Service Specialists. Um, foreign Service Officers uh, can uh, have one of five areas of specialty. I've listed those here, Consular, economic, management, political, and public diplomacy. Um, I'm a public diplomacy foreign service officer, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what these other categories are when I talk about my own career. And then we have foreign service specialists. Um, and foreign service specialists can come in with particular technical expertise. You'll see here certainly medical professionals, engineers, our security engineering officers, um, our financial managers, some folks that come in with real expertise in particular areas, our facilities managers as well. Um, and they stay in the, the career specialty that they've chosen uh, as they progress up uh, the ranks and in responsibility. Our diplomatic security special agents are a bit um, of a, a different beast that I always like to just spend a little time on. Um, our diplomatic security special agents may come in with expertise in uh, the security fields. They may have a background in law enforcement or in the military, or they may not. Um, uh, but our diplomatic security bureau trains everyone. They are law enforcement officers with responsibilities uh, for particular uh, areas, particularly passports and visas, the integrity and security of those. Um, but they're responsible for all of the security programs for the Department of State, for our personnel and our buildings and operations all around the world. They also do what I call uh, security diplomacy. They run uh, training programs, uh, exchange programs with uh, security forces, law enforcement agencies around the world to try and enhance rule of law around the world. Um, so it's a really fascinating career choice and I'm happy to answer uh, additional uh, questions about that as we go along. Um, what does a career in the Foreign Service look like? Uh, I'll talk to you about my career and my life in the Foreign Service, um, and then I will go into a little bit how you join the Foreign Service. So I've been a Foreign Service officer now for um, over 23 years, 23 and a half at this point. Um, I joined the Foreign Service um, pretty soon after college. I always knew that I wanted to do something that was internationally focused. I just had a real passion for exploring the world and getting to know people from other countries. Um, but I also wanted a job that was gonna uh, have a degree of public service in it. Uh, I grew up with a real strong sense of civic responsibility um, and wanted to be able to do a job that I felt was purposeful. Uh, I went to college and ended up studying international relations, but by no means do you have to study international relations to join the Foreign Service. Um, we accept all degrees. Uh, I just coincidentally did international relations. Um, and I studied abroad my junior year. I went to Cameroon. Let's see if I can, oh, I can't use my pointer, but that's okay. Uh, there in Central Africa. Um, and while I was in Cameroon, I just had such an amazing experience um, getting to know people, uh, they had a presidential election there for the first time since independence, and I spent a lot of time talking to people about uh, elections in the United States and democracy in the United States. Um, and when I came back, I was just really enthusiastic about representing the U.S. and engaging with other countries and people about the United States. And a professor directed me to the Foreign Service. And thus, my interest began. Um, I did some research. I coincidentally met some people who had retired from the Foreign Service, which was really helpful to me. Um, and I took the test my senior year. Um, 
I um, made it through the first part of the testing process, but I did not succeed on the oral exam. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. That's very common. Um, it is not an easy process. It's fairly competitive. And we do encourage people, don't be discouraged if you don't make it. Um, most of us in the Foreign Service did not make it on our first try. Um, I tried again the next year and was successful. Um, and um, about another year later, I was invited into a, a, what we call an A100 class, an orientation class. So from the time I took the test, starting the second time when I did pass all the way through to when I entered a class was about 23 months. And that is fairly typical. We do tell folks that to, the process for joining the Foreign Service can take 18 to 24 months. So it is not an instantaneous uh, application process, but uh, it is worthwhile and sticking with it uh, is worth it. So I joined an A100 class and was sent to Nepal um, on my first assignment. Um, I don't know if how many folks can see the pictures on the on the right hand side of the screen there, but there is a picture of me in Nepal there. Uh, <laughs> my, my screen is covered up with other images. Um, so I did uh, go to Nepal on my first tour, and um, your first two assignments in the Foreign Service for officers and specialists alike are what we call directed. The department will send you where the department needs you to go. Um, a lot of factors go into that decision. Some of it is just what is the need at the time for employees, and some of it is also what does the department's uh, Human Resources Bureau know that you need uh, in order to have a wide experience on your first two tours. Um, because your first four years are, think of them as a bit probationary. You're testing out the career, we're testing out you. And so we want to give you opportunities to succeed and opportunities to have different experiences. So on my first tour, uh, I was, uh, I had to learn a foreign language, which is part of what you have to do when you're in those first four years um, before you can get what we call tenure. So I studied Nepali um, and then I went to Nepal and my first year I did political work. And political and economic work are very similar. Uh, they're what we call reporting jobs. And your job is to, you to get assigned a set of issues and you become an expert in those issues and you make contacts and you develop relationships with people working in those fields um, so that you can both communicate what the US position is on certain issues um, and influence uh, on behalf of the US government on certain issues but also so you can gather information and gather a picture of what is going on so that you can write reports and inform Washington um, and inform the foreign policy making process. So in Nepal, my issues were human rights, uh, labor, particularly child labor, refugee issues, and Nepal's relationship with India and China, its big neighbors. Uh, it was a fascinating year. I learned a ton, um, met some really interesting people, um, and then my second year I did consular work. And consular work is twofold. One, you're facilitating legal travel uh, by people from other countries to the United States, either for short-term purposes, tourism, school, um, temporary work, um, or for long-term purposes, immigration purposes. Um, and you're also providing assistance to American citizens. On a simple day, that can be as easy as replacing a lost or stolen passport, um, to helping people that are sick, um, in trouble, people who have been arrested, or people in a crisis. Like right now, you need to help them uh, to get home, uh, get the help that they need. So it's a very powerful um, uh, experience to be a consular officer because it is a very um, personal one-on-one. -on -one. You're helping people on a daily basis, um, and that can be um, exhausting and rewarding at the same time. Um, I then went back to Washington, D.C., which was a little atypical. Um, typically, you're going to spend your first two tours overseas. Um, but I went back to D.C. I worked in our operations center as a watch officer, um, and I also worked for our Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Um, before I then went into Arabic language training for two full years. Um, this is one of the great things about the department. Um, we do invest in our people quite a lot. We do a lot of professional training, a lot of leadership management training, um, but the training you're probably gonna get most in the Foreign Service is language training. Um, in my 23 years, I've spent three and a half years total studying language full time. So I did my six months in Nepali, I did two years of Arabic, and I did a year of Macedonian later on. Um, and my full time job was to study a language. 
Um, so I did that. Uh, my second year was in Tunisia. That was where we had our Arabic language school at the time. Before I then went on to um, Egypt where I worked in public diplomacy. And public diplomacy work is just what it says. It's working with um, public audiences um, to try and uh, educate people uh, about the United States, share information, share experiences about the United States, uh, influence people to, to think positively about the United States. Um, uh, you do this through a variety of different programs, exchange programs, educational programs, uh, English language teaching programs, uh, speaker programs where we bring experts from the United States to another country to speak on different topics, um, and then also media engagement. Uh, public diplomacy officers do a lot of media engagement and do a lot of public speaking. Um, it was a great couple of years in Egypt. Um, I also spent um, six months working in Baghdad, Iraq, uh, working at the time that was 2004, and I was working uh, to help set up our public diplomacy programs there. But a big part of my job was also working with uh, Iraqis who wanted to establish an independent media um, and become uh, accountable independent journalists uh, in a post Saddam Hussein Iraq. Uh, it was very rewarding. Um, uh, we were there helping them to learn some of the, the ins and outs of journalism, make sure that they had access to US government officials. Uh, we even sent one uh, Iraqi journalist uh, to Washington where he interviewed President Bush in the White House, which was unbelievable for him. Uh, he had never been outside uh, Iraq, so he was pretty excited. Um, after Egypt and Iraq, I spent four years in Jerusalem where I was uh, the head of our public diplomacy operation there. Uh, doing all the programs that I just talked about, um, doing a lot of uh, media engagement as well. Um, after Jerusalem, I went back to Washington, where the department very kindly sent me back to school. I was able to earn a master's degree at the National War College, uh, another example of them investing in, in my professional development. Um, before I went overseas again to Croatia, where I was an economic officer, uh, working on regional economic issues out of our embassy in Zagreb, Croatia. Um, I then went back to Washington again, where I was the director of our crisis management unit in the operations center for a couple of years before doing Macedonian language training and then going to Skopje, North Macedonia as the deputy chief of mission. As the deputy chief of mission, I was uh, the number two in the embassy, uh, working closely with the ambassador to implement uh, strategic direction and overall uh, operational oversight of the embassy, working closely with all of our section heads and agency heads at the embassy. Um, I then came to this job, um, where I am really happy to be talking about uh, the Foreign Service and the Department of State and all the different opportunities for getting student training uh, and employment with the department. It's been, for me, an incredible career. Um, I've, um, I met my husband in the Foreign Service. He's also a Foreign Service officer. We had three children along the way. Um, so our children have grown up in the Foreign Service. Um, and I truly loved it. Um, I've loved every minute. Um, it's been sometimes really hard. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, very emotionally draining. <laughs> but it's also been incredibly rewarding. Um, and the best part of the job is the people that you work with and the people that you get to meet uh, in every country. Um, if you sort of paid attention along the, the trajectory of my career, you notice that I did a variety of different jobs. And that is fairly typical of Foreign Service officers to do jobs, even though my, my specialty is public diplomacy, to do jobs outside of public diplomacy uh, is, is not unexpected. Um, I probably did a little bit more because I'm I'm married. I'm a tandem, is what we call ourselves, uh, when two foreign service officers are married to each other. Um, and to make those assignments work, you um, you make some you take creative paths. So it's worked out really well, and I've enjoyed every tour. So let me take a moment to talk a little bit about the process for joining the foreign service. <clears throat> I'm just going to take a drink of water. Um, <clears throat> there's so the process for joining the Foreign Service for officers and specialists is just slightly different. Um, and I'll go through the officer process first and then the, talk a little bit about the specialist process. So um, the first thing you have to do when you are thinking about the Foreign Service is decide which of these five career tracks appeals to you. 
Um, and they are quite different, and we have a lot of information on our website, careers.state.gov, um, including video testimonials from people about their experience in the different, um, what we call cones. Once you've decided on a cone, um, then you complete an application, which includes these personal narratives that we are asking for. The personal narratives um, help us get a better sense of you, your experience, and what your experiences have taught you and, and what kind of skills you would be coming to the Foreign Service with. One thing that's really important to understand is in the Foreign Service, we're not looking for you to have followed one particular path to join us. Um, we really want a diversity of experience and people, um, perspectives uh, to represent the United States. It makes us a stronger organization. But we are looking for what we call 13 dimensions. And these are different qualities that we've identified as making for good foreign service officers and specialists. And so these personal narratives help us get a sense of who you are um, and what you would be bringing to the foreign service as an individual. Uh, you then would take uh, the foreign service officer test, which is a general knowledge multiple choice test. There are two essays as well to be written during that time. The only part that's gonna be scored originally is the multiple choice general knowledge part. If you score above the threshold uh, for the general knowledge portion, then your essays, your personal narratives, and your applications will go to what we call the qualifications evaluation panel. And that is when a panel of individuals in the Foreign Service will look at your, your application materials um, and will score you against those 13 dimensions. If you uh, score across the threshold again, get enough of a high enough score, these are both sort of pass-fail phases, then you're invited to an oral assessment. And the oral assessment is a day-long um, in-person evaluation process. And for Foreign Service officer candidates, it includes a group exercise, what we call an ambassador's briefing, um, which is an oral briefing to an individual playing the role of an ambassador, um, a structured interview, hypothetical situations, um, and uh, another writing exercise. At the end of that day, you're told whether or not you you passed and you're told what your score is. Um, that's the score that actually matters. Um, at that point, you will then go through security clearances and medical clearances. Your whole application will get one final review. And if you're successful, you'll be placed on uh, the register of available candidates. And your spot on the register is determined by your score at that oral assessment. You can do a couple things to bump up your score. You can take language tests to show your language proficiency. Uh, if you have uh, military service, your veteran status can bump up your score as well. You're on that register until we invite you to an orientation class. Um, we form orientation classes multiple times a year. Um, and we would call you and invite you. If it worked at the time it worked out for you, great. You're allowed to decline an offer um, once, if you decline it more than uh, once, then we will take you off the list. You're also allowed to be on the register for 18 months. So it, where you are on the register can influence how quickly you come in. For specialists, it's very similar. Um, the only specialists at this point that are required to take a test up front are our information management specialists. Um, Everyone else goes straight to the qualification evaluation panel. The oral assessment is slightly different. It doesn't include the group exercise or the ambassador's briefing for specialists, but the rest of the process is the same. Um, and for a couple of the specialties, you do have to also submit um, your evidence of technical expertise and if you're licensed in certain areas, those kinds of things. The one um, that I also will talk about that um, is slightly different, uh, the Consular Fellows Program. This is a non-career uh, employment opportunity for folks that have uh, language skills in Spanish, Arabic, Mandarin, or Portuguese. Um, and the while our Foreign Service officers and specialists do have an age requirement about entry, you have to be 59. Um, uh, you can't be older than 59 when you enter. And for the diplomatic security special agents, you have to be um, 38. For uh, consular fellows, there is no age limit because it's not a career appointment. It's a five-year appointment to do consular work uh, in 
uh, and in embassies where there's a need for these language skills. So the test is a little bit similar. Um, the process is a little similar. There's a consular fellows test. Um, there's the qualification evaluation panel, language test, because we are hiring you for your language. The oral assessment is more similar to the specialist oral assessment. And then clearances, suitability, and placement. There are some opportunities, though, if you're not ready to take on a full-time job, <laughs> you're still a student. Um, there are a number of different student opportunities as well. Um, there are internships. Uh, we offer unpaid internships three times a year. We also have a paid internship, uh, which is a merit-based, need-based program. It's actually a two-summer paid internship. It's a great program. We also have this, the Virtual Student Federal Service Program, which is an, uh, a virtual internship that goes throughout a student's academic year. Um, and you would do a project-based internship for an office in Washington, D.C. or for an embassy somewhere around the world. Those are fantastic opportunities for students who can't travel, um, uh, who just want to get a taste of federal service. Um, we also have uh, several fellowships that I'll flag for folks. Uh, the Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship is a, is a fantastic program. It's for undergraduate or graduate students. Um, it pays for... Um, two years of your junior and senior year of undergraduate or two years of graduate study um, includes two paid summer internships. And then you come in at the end of the program as a foreign uh, service information management specialist. Similarly, our Pickering and Wrangell fellowships are fellowships for graduate study for folks that are interested in becoming foreign service officers. Again, the fellowship pays for the graduate school education two paid summer internships, and at the end you come in as a foreign service officer. Um, we have so many other student programs that are out there, the Wrangell Summer Enrichment, which is a five week uh, seminar program. There's uh, the Critical Language Scholarship, the Born Scholarship, Fulbright, so many great opportunities. Um, and I do encourage students to take a look at all of those uh, online. I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to just, um, I hope everybody can see this, my contact information. Um, but I do want to emphasize my job is not just to talk at people um, in person or virtually, um, but to coach and mentor folks that are interested in joining the Foreign Service. So if you are interested in any of these opportunities, the student programs, the work programs, um, I'm here for you. I do office hours all the time. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations. I'm pretty good about getting back to people on email quickly. Um, so I am your resource. It is not a straightforward path um, into the Foreign Service. And so we know that we, it's, we need to help people navigate that. And that's my job. So please, um, anytime you want to talk, you can reach out. So why don't I stop there? Sure. I've got a whole bunch of questions. So we will be monitoring the chat function and take questions from people who are tuning in. So please type in your questions. And if you want to take your picture at the top um, <laughs> of the background and put your video so we can see where you are and um, wave at you from around the world, that would be really very great because we have about 25 people joining. So it'll be fun to see those faces from around the world. Okay, so Michaela, I have a question while we're waiting for some more to come in through the chat feature. So you went to Brown and you studied international relations and you speak Arabic, which it sounds like you learned. So what is the Foreign Service's dream candidate? Is it somebody who speaks Arabic already? Is it a female? Is it someone who grew up in a big city? What is the dream candidate right now for the Foreign Service? Mm, good question, Lisa. Um, you know, we don't, there's no one ideal candidate. Um, we are, uh, we, we are looking for a diversity of candidates. Um, I think one of the, um, our, our main objective is in bringing in people who have those 13 skills and qualities that I talked about. And some of it's, you know, communication skills, leadership skills, cultural adaptability, um, interpersonal skills, these kinds of things. So we're really looking for folks that um, are, are individually talented. Um, and they're, as I said, their path getting to getting those skills um, is interesting to us, but we are, there's no one, one path. Um, I think one of our priorities is making sure that folks that may not 
think, oh, I'm not foreign service material, making sure that they know everybody's foreign service material. There's no, there's, um, you know, that, I, that I'm from the East Coast and I studied international relations is a little cliche. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be from the East Coast and have studied international relations um, to join the foreign service. Um, and that's why we have so many student programs and our fellowship programs is to really make sure that folks that want to see themselves in the foreign service can get those opportunities. Um, making sure that the foreign service reflects who we are as the United States and uh, American citizens is really important. So making sure that we have a, a good cross section of the United States and a wide diversity of representation is our priority. Okay, so how about people who are joining the Foreign Service? What's the typical age? Are they people coming right out of undergraduate or graduate? Are they people with 10, 20, 40 years of experience? What is a typical person who's starting? Yeah, so again, we don't have, we're, we're so atypical. Um, <laughs> uh, the average age of people who join is about 34. And that does represent that there's a spectrum, um, that we have folks who are joining um, out of college, but we also have folks that are joining who maybe are on their second career, um, particularly folks that you know have had a 20 year career in the military. We have a lot of folks who, who just love that lifestyle and want to keep uh, the adventure and, and see similarities in the foreign service. So you know, we get folks who have served 20 years in the military and are starting a second career with us uh, in their 50s. Um, but we get people who come from all different backgrounds, um, you know, teachers, lawyers, um, business leaders, um, every, everything uh, you can possibly imagine. Um, but it is that spectrum, which is why the age, the, the average is about 34. Okay. Hey, Logan. Hey, thanks for turning your video on so we can see you there. So Logan wants to know about how many points does the Bourne Award and other scholarships and the other tests give you at the end of the test? A rough estimate of how many points you get from those. Um, well, the points that you would get from those would depend on um, the language that you were able to study in those programs and then um, uh, your language test. Um, and I should know this off the top of my head, but um, I, I deliver, they sort of, I don't know all the ins and outs of the testing, um, and that's a little bit deliberate because um, I don't talk to the, every single person that takes the test, so I can talk to you about the process and in general terms, but the, the specifics sometimes um, are, are more closely kept, so we don't unduly advantage one applicant over another. Um, but you would get test points um, for um, your language. Um, and I can get back to you about, I feel like I just read the other day, um, but I would, I would wanna go back and double check on the exact number of points. Great, can you post that on our Facebook page so that yeah, Logan and everybody else can see it? Make some notes here. <laughs> Fabulous. I'll remind you too. So Sierra Justice has a question I was wondering as well. So she says, do you have any recommendations for studying for the Foreign Service Officer entrance exam? So I've heard that the exam is quite rigorous. And for overachievers like myself, who likes to prepare and over-prepare for things, what could I do? Should I be binge watching Khan Academy classes on US history? Should I be going to every single Alaska World Affairs Council program there is out there? Shameless plug. What, what should you be doing um, to study for the Foreign Service exam? Yeah, um, so we, I think going to every single Alaska World Affairs Council program is a great idea. Um, <laughs> I'll go along with that. Um, I think um, what I always advise people, um, there's a couple things I say. First, um, you can practice. Um, we have a great app called DOS Careers. It's just DOS Careers. Um, and you can download that. And one of the fantastic features of that app is that it has a test yourself button. And in it are um, sort of quiz packets for all the different topics that are in the Foreign Service Officer exam. Um, and these are all retired questions. So they're real questions that were on the test at one point. Um, 
and you can can quiz yourself and and the app will tell you how you're doing it'll give you a percentage well you're doing you know you've got 70 percent in economics but you're 100 percent in world politics or you're um uh you know it, it, whatever it is so you can see where your strengths and your weaknesses are by topic um and i always encourage folks to do that um and then they can focus in on where their weaknesses are if your weakness is on you know, constitutional amendments, then you can spend some time studying up on constitutional amendments. So I do encourage folks to use that as a little bit of a guide because otherwise, you know, it's, it's general knowledge. So you can't, you can't do everything at once. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, the advice is really be well read, be well informed. Um, so to the extent that you can participate in programs and or read uh, publications or materials that are going to give you uh, a wide breadth of knowledge, um, that's really helpful. Um, the old adage when I was looking at the Foreign Service was read the New York Times cover to cover every day. Um, with the idea being, if you read the New York Times every day, cover to cover, um, you would get world affairs, you'd get domestic affairs, you'd get um, business, you'd get economics, you'd get culture, you'd get literature, you'd get opinion. And in reading all of those, you'd be absorbing um, historical references, you'd be absorbing uh, the principles um, of economics and politics and all these other things. Um, and that, that that kind of general knowledge that you'd be gleaning from reading the newspaper every day um, would be the best preparation. Um, and in a lot of ways, that is still true. It doesn't have to be the New York Times. Um, you the can Economist. I think The Economist would probably do it, huh? The Economist is great. Um, not as strong on the culture and the literature part, um, which is important, and you still have to do that part. Um, and, and, but yeah, it, what I tell people is be well read. Um, you know, read a variety of sources, read about a variety of topics. There's some amazing podcasts out there now um, that are great preparation for the Foreign Service. If you're, you know, looking for something about economics or you're thinking about something about world history. Um, so there's so many ways to prepare. Um, but I, I think um, it can be helpful to take those quizzes to, to narrow in on where your strengths and weaknesses are. Wonderful. Okay, Patrick Marshall has a question. Hey, Patrick. So he wants to know, are there any mentorship opportunities for high school students that you're aware of? Maybe something with you in Washington, D.C. or somewhere around the world. If you're a high school student, how can you get involved with a mentorship opportunity? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions and, and uh, do consultations. I do sometimes get high school students who reach out. Um, um, there, um, the other thing, we do have an internship program, an internship experience that high school students can take advantage of um, if the opportunity is offered. So it's a little, it's a little uh, hit or miss on this one, but you can look at the Pathways, it's called the Pathways Internship Experience Program, and you can find information about that on careers.state.gov. Um, and sometimes we do offer uh, high school level um, internships under that program. So that is one opportunity. I think for high school students, um, I mean, participating in, in programs like this with the World Affairs Council is a great way to, to get uh, experience and to make contacts with folks that are professionals in the field of, of um, you know, international affairs, whether it be through an NGO or business or government, um, I think that, that that's a great thing to do. Um, and then, um, you know, looking at maybe some of the um, um, summer programs that some schools offer, universities offer, uh, the Congressional PAGE program is also a fantastic way to get familiar with uh, federal service. So those are some ideas I have. Well, you know, it's really interesting, this concept about mentorship, right? I mean, here we are doing a Zoom program with people all over the world, and it seems to me like this could be extended to mentorships. You mentioned people can reach out to you directly. Just, just to throw it out there, what is the possibility of somebody sitting here in Alaska reaching out to a foreign service officer sitting in Macedonia and having this virtual mentorship? Do you think it's possible? Um, it, it, it's not impossible. Um, the one thing I will say is, um, 
I think particularly when you're overseas, um, officers time is, um, they, we work hard. Um, and so I think if you, um, certainly if you know somebody, uh, if you have a particular interest, um, when I was overseas, we would always get letters and, and inquiries from high school students or college students asking for, you know, could I do a quick informational interview? I'm working on this project, or could you answer some questions in a letter? And we always tried to do, to answer those, um, because it was really important for us to support, um, people's curiosity and to make sure that they we were breeding a new generation of uh, internationally minded americans and um so it's not impossible just with the caveat that um uh, folks overseas do tend to have very full um plates on uh, so i will just caution <laughs> Contact, and contact information for foreign service officers around the world that's usually available on the different u.s embassy websites isn't that yeah, you can always write. And actually, what I always encourage people to do is to write to the general, um, the general inbox that we have um, on our websites. Uh, those are really closely monitored, and the the person that monitors that will then um, identify which section is best able to answer your question, and and uh, then they'll follow up with you. Okay, so keep those questions coming. I've got a lot more here. So. Let's say I speak fluent Arabic and I do okay on your ex the exam and I want to join the Foreign Service and I'm accepted. What are the chances that my first post posting will be in an Arabic speaking country if I'm fluent in Arabic? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> it, who knows? You might. <laughs> it's really unknown. Um, and it really does depend um, on what the needs are of the department at that time. So if, um, you know, if, if the department has the human resources, our, our Bureau of Global Talent Management, um, which is what we call our human resources uh, department, if they know that we need uh, a number of individuals that, that have, we have an urgent need for people speaking Arabic, then, then chances are you might get sent out to a post uh, for Arabic immediately. We might also though look at it as an opportunity if the, if the need is not immediate, but maybe a few months from then, uh, we might look at it as an opportunity to train up some of your colleagues from your class in Arabic. Um, and since you already have the Arabic, we might say, oh, great, okay, let's maybe teach you another language. Um, or we have this really urgent need right now in London or someplace where you don't need to have a language, so let's send you there because you already have the Arabic. Let's train up some more Arabic speakers because over the long term, we have to think about what is our long term need. So it, it really depends on what the need is at the time um and um and what resources the department has and needs um so we try and take a really uh, a global picture um to to put that that all together um we also want to give you an opportunity to learn a language in our system and to show us how you do at learning languages so it may be that um you know we need a whole bunch of spanish speakers and so we think oh great let's let's put you in spanish we'll see how you do in the language you get to go to Mexico or Bogota or wherever. Um, and then, you know, next, you've got the Arabic. We're not worried about that. Um, so really, it really depends. Um, but I do caution people, um, expect the unexpected. Don't assume you're gonna go to, to a place where, uh, you know, um, don't assume where you're going. I came into the Foreign Service speaking French um, and was sure that, oh, I'll get sent somewhere where they need somebody with French. And in fact, they had some place on the list. Um, but I didn't go there. I went to Nepal. Um, and, uh, I've never actually been to a post where I've had to use my French. So, <laughs> um, but it's been great. That's funny. Okay. I love that. Expect the unexpected. So where did you get posted that was unexpected that you really enjoyed? Um, I mean, I've enjoyed all my assignments. I there has not been a single one that, I regretted doing or a place that I, I would go back to all of the places that I was assigned. Um, but certainly, you know, as um, a young 24 year old, being assigned to Kathmandu, Nepal was probably pretty, un that was pretty unexpected. Like I did not think, 
that was not what I, 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 mean, I you know, I think I had to look it up. <laughs> Where is this place? Um, all I knew was the Cat Stevens song. So, you know, um, it was, uh, but, um, but a more amazing opportunity and posting I could not have asked for on my first assignment. It was magical. And um, I, I hope that I get to go back someday. Okay, so I liked your slide where you had the world and you had stars on all of the places you've been posted. So how long does a typical posting last for someone in the Foreign Service? Are we talking about a year, two years, 20 years? How long is a typical Foreign Service posting? Yeah, your first two tours will be two years each. Um, so uh, entry level officers always get two year assignments. After that, it really depends on um, what what the place where the place is. So, what are the circumstances for that place? Um, if generally tours will be three years, if it's a bit of a harder place to live, uh, it might be two years. Um, if it's a, a quite a dangerous place to be, it will more likely be one year. But generally, two to three years, uh, with three years being the majority of postings. And, and after your first two tours, when you get through that, um, uh, that, that trial period that I mentioned, and you get what we call tenure, then you have a lot more control over your assignments. Um, and you're the one that's looking at the list of available positions, and you're the one deciding, well, I'm going to put in um, bids, applications for these assignments. Um, and I want to, you know, so then you are really driving your career um, quite a bit more. And you're the diplomat in residence for the Northwest. Is that typically an entry level job? Is this a mid career level job? Is it a stepping stone to something else? Or where does that fall in the whole foreign <laughs> service realm? Yeah, it's actually, um, uh, it's very unique in the Foreign Service in that it's not um, a position that's tied to a particular grade. So um, we have folks that are diplomats and residents who are mid-level officers, um, senior officers. Um, it's, not, it's not an entry-level position because you do need to have some experience, but, um, but we do have folks uh, with a real wide range of backgrounds and experiences in the Foreign Service. Um, um, the only thing that's required is a real passion for the Foreign Service and an enthusiasm about uh, getting out and talking to folks about the Foreign Service. Okay, so I know there were many different pillars and different tracks, but let's say I'm joining this Foreign Service. What would my typical first year entail in my first five to ten years? I'm assuming I'm not ambassador to Qatar my first year. I'm assuming I'm in some dark room reading the newspapers. Is that true? Or what is a first year foreign service officer doing in someone five to 10 years in their career? Um, yeah, it, well, you're definitely not in a dark room um, uh, reading newspapers. I mean, you do read newspapers, but, um, um, and you're, you're definitely not an ambassador. No, you know, I think, um, you know, my first year, everybody's, everybody is doing engagement with foreign and foreign citizens so a huge chunk of what we do you know I, people often ask me what's a typical day in the foreign service like and again there's there's just no typical day um really um you can think oh i know what i'm going to do today and you get to the office and it's completely different uh, depending on what the priorities are or the developments are um but if you take a look at kind of an average week everybody, and this includes entry-level officers, is doing some combination of kind of three things. One is you're, you're, you're engaging with citizens of the country that we are uh, um, assigned to. And that could be um, do, meeting with um, officials, government officials, it could be meeting with public groups, um, it could be talking to business leaders, um, you know, working with the American Chamber, it could be um, it, for consular officers, you're spending a huge chunk of time talking to foreign citizens that would like to come to the United States. Um, so a big chunk of your time is spent just engaging with uh, individuals of the country you're in. Um, another big chunk of your time is spent um, coordinating and collaborating within the embassy. An embassy is a, a, 
it's a it's like a mini U.S. government. So there's the State Department, but then there's also representatives of all the other agencies that have a foreign presence at the embassy. So you, if you're working in the political section and you're working on political military affairs, you're definitely going to be doing a lot of collaboration, for example, with our defense attache. Um, uh, on on your work. So we're always trying to find how do we work collaboratively across the embassy so that we're making sure that we're working as a single unit towards our strategic goals. Um, and then the other third of your time is going to be doing a lot of reporting. Um, everybody does reporting. Um, you know, it could be a political officers writing cables on a particular subject. Um, it could be consular officers um, writing up analysis and evaluations of what are the trends that we're seeing in visa applicants at the time, uh, which can tell us quite a bit about a country. Could be public diplomacy officers um, writing up um, evaluations of programs they've done. Um, and a lot of writing is also about strategic planning. How do we how do we need to move forward on our objectives? How do we how do we practically move forward to achieve the strategic objectives that are the U.S. priorities in this country? Um, and so, even if you're a first tour officer, um, you're doing those things. Um, you may be doing that um, with a bit more guidance and mentorship, um, but um, but you're still doing all that stuff. I mean, I had as a first tour officer. Um, I was out talking to folks and doing research on my areas of expertise, um, you know, with guidance from my boss in the front office, but I was out doing my own research and talking to people and writing my cables. And um, it's a really empowering um, experience. I um, was sometimes, it was humbling the amount of responsibility I had as a first tour officer in the foreign service. Okay, so you also had show the different pillars and the different paths. And Sierra wants to know if you could talk about why you chose the public diplomacy path. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, Sierra, I was really lucky when I came into the Foreign Service because um, at the time the department was doing, um, was letting people come in without having to pick a comb. So you could come in and be uncombed, as we called ourselves. Um, and then you got to, you didn't have to choose a specialty, a cone, until you um, were approved for tenure. So it gave us the chance to really get a good sense of what the different um, paths were. And um, I joined the Foreign Service right when um, the U.S. Information Agency, if anyone knows what that is, um, <laughs> I was being merged into the State Department. Um, and so by the time I was uh, able to pick a cone, public diplomacy was available for the first time to us. Um, and I chose public diplomacy because I really liked um, the work. I liked getting out and talking to people. I liked um, the taking our, our policy objectives and translating that into strategic um, public engagement programs. I liked that, that strategic planning. I liked um, the, the human interaction, the, the big people interactions and talking with folks. And um, the, I really love representing the United States and talking about the United States to, to people. And, um, and that's, uh, that's always appealed to me. So it just, it seemed to fit um, my passions. Um, and um, I don't shy away from talking with people as you all can see from today. <laughs> but, so, um, so I like the idea of also being able to just have conversations with, with different groups of people in other countries. Okay, so, so finances are a concern for people right now. So what is a typical starting salary for someone in the Foreign Service? Are we talking about $20,000 or $200,000? What's a typical starting salary? What can you expect? And then how does that progress? Right. Um, so a typical, so again, there's no, I can't give you an exact figure, but I can give you a range. Um, typical starting salaries in the Foreign Service generally range between forty-five dollars and $85,000 a year. Um, and a lot of that depends on kind of the experience that you bring. Um, uh, the degrees that you're coming with. Um, so there's a fa there's a whole formula that goes into figuring out um, what what you come in as. Um, and then you quickly, um, we do a couple of administrative promotions uh, fairly quickly within that period of time when you're before you get tenure. Um, 
So that changes pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when you go overseas, um, the benefits include um, your housing is paid for, uh, your basic utilities are paid for, uh, your medical care is all paid for. Um, if you have children, we pay for your children's uh, equivalent up to uh, 12th grade high school, up to 12th grade education. Um, uh, you know, you, um, we also have a student loan repayment program um, and we have um, our retirement benefits um, are, are very good. Um, so while our straight up salary doesn't necessarily compare to a Google or a Facebook, um, the, the benefits, when you start adding in the benefits, um, it is quite competitive. And then you have the, the, what is it, the priceless benefit of getting to see the world and explore the world. Okay, now we're going a little bit to COVID-19 and the pandemic. So, so first, I'm going to just say, so I have two adult kids who are hunkering down abroad. One's in Norway and one's in Bermuda. Hey, guys. And so what are the foreign service offices, the embassies in different countries doing right now to help U.S. citizens? Are they really busy or are they, have they left their posting? Or what are the foreign service officers doing around the world for US citizens who are hunkering down or are in other countries? Yeah, no, they're, they're incredibly busy um, as I've talked to folks around the world. Um, um, <clears throat> I mean, our, our consular officers have been working on assisting American citizens in relationship to, to the current um, health situation since early January. Um, and we've evacuated um, tens of thousands of people already um, from around the world. Um, so what our consular officers, um, and in fact, actually, it's not just everybody's a consular officer. This is one of the things about the Foreign Service is everybody is required to do consular work uh, when you're an entry level officer. Um, and that is because at the heart of every Foreign Service officer, you, you are a consular officer. Um, when things go poorly, um, like they have right now, and, and Americans need help, that is everybody's duty, is to help American citizens. So um, our embassies are working around the clock. Um, we have a task force in Washington that is working around the clock 24-7, um, trying to identify the Americans that do need help around the world, uh, where they are, and then what resources do we need to apply to, um, to help them. Um, and we always have a... a a big basket of resources that we try and, and bring to the table. Um, but um, they are right now just really um, seized with trying to help American citizens um, and to get them the assistance to either come home if they if that is what they choose to do or to, to stay safe where they are. Okay, so here's a question from Rebecca. So with the current pandemic that's going on, do you foresee that increasing or decreasing the needs for, or even stalling the process for joining the Foreign Service. Does this have any effect on the process of joining the Foreign Service? Um, it's um, paused the in-person interviews at the moment, just because for everybody's health and safety, um, including applicants who would otherwise have to travel to, to come to the, to the interviews, we have had to pause those. And, um, we're, um, our, my colleagues are, are looking at what the potential is to restart those at, a, at the appropriate time in a healthy and safe way. Um, but you know, when we hire, we hire for the, as I said, it takes 18 to 24 months to get in, to, to go through the process. So, um, so we really always try and keep up um, engagement and uh, to make sure that we are talking with folks and making sure that they if pe people are interested in, in starting the process that they start the process and that they move ahead um, because it is such a long lag time between when you apply to when you enter um, that we always do want to keep that pipeline um, moving along um, so our hiring process is always uh, with an eye towards not just today but you know to from today to two years out to four years out. So we're always looking and, and so we continue that process. Um, we have had to make some adjustments and um, just in the immediate in terms of some of the, the elements of the evaluation process, but um, uh, that will continue. 
Okay, so we have one more minute of our lunch hour. Anything you else you want to depart to our folks, maybe a website or something you wish you had known um, <laughs> a few years ago when you were looking at this process? Yeah, well, I do definitely encourage everybody to visit careers.state.gov. Um, that is where we have every piece of information. It's a great website. It has a lot of little cookies everywhere. Make sure you always scroll down to the bottom of the page. That's my tip for the day. Um, and you can also, um, if you didn't catch my email address, um, there's two ways to find me. You can go to the Facebook page for the Diplomat in Residence, which was tagged for this event. So you can find me that way. Um, or you can go on that careers.state.gov um, and go to connect and you can connect with me there. Um, in terms of just one last piece of advice that I will give, I will say that um, this is a really amazing career. Um, there are so many opportunities for folks with all sorts of different talents. Um, you know, if you have technical talents, if you have writing talents, speaking talents, if you're an amazing human resource manager, we want you. Um, we're a global organization um, and we have a global operation. Um, so we always have needs at all levels of the organization and all the different aspects of what we do. Um, and, and don't be shy about pursuing it. If you think it's of interest to you, pursue it. You should see yourself in the job um, because you can do it. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for <laughs> Michaela. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here at the Alaska World Affairs Council and for supporting our commitment to bringing quality educational programs to you and increasing all of our global competency. If you have any comments or questions, this was our very first virtual lunch with leaders, please send them our way. We do appreciate the feedback and we hope to do a lot more. Of course, if you want to make a donation to the Alaska World Affairs Council, please go to alaskaworldaffairs.org because your contribution makes it possible for us to deliver programs like the one we today and the next one we're working on, which is based on feedback we've been getting from our members. We've heard from you that you want to connect with people around the world via Zoom and talk about life today from our different perspectives and share what each of us are looking forward to in the future. So this is gonna be an incredible hour of connecting with other people around the world. We hope to have some of our former speakers join us and hope you well as well during this program. We're gonna send out more information about this upcoming program on our website, Facebook, and email. Um, if you're not on our email list, just drop us a line at info at alaskaworldaffairs.org and we'll add you. Tell your friends all about us. Let them know how they can plug into the Alaska World Affairs Council programs. And thank you so much, Michaela Schweitzer-Bloom, and all of you out there for sharing your lunch hour with us. And we look forward to connecting with all of you again soon. Have a great, safe day.